a larger number of people than I expected are not good at their jobs. And it's not because they lack the skill. It's because they lack the hustle. Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Rob Smat, man. How you doing, brother? I am super happy to be here. I'm so excited to talk about this movie. And uh, I mean, I'm a huge time, long time fan and, uh, you know, just thrilled to be here. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. You were telling me earlier off air that uh, that Indie Film Hustle had a little bit to do with uh, helping you make the movie. A little bit. I mean, it's got everything to do. It's got everything to do with this movie. Um, I, I started listening to Indie Film Hustle uh, a year or two ago, at least, if not longer. And, uh, and and every episode, it's just like there's something else that I hadn't heard before. There's something else I didn't learn in the film school track. Mm-hmm. And uh, just just so specific to the kind of thing that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And this, I mean, just everything on this podcast was super, super helpful. So, you know, the stuff that I want to, you know, hopefully help everybody with today, I hope mm-hmm. it's going to be very specific. And this is going to be Indie Film Hustle, you know, veteran, you know, it's not just going to be, <laughs> how'd you make your movie? It's like, let me tell you about the deal structure of X, Y, and Z. So, I'll, you know, we'll have fun. I appreciate that, brother. So, all right. So first question, how did you get into the film business? Good question. Um, I was, uh, you know, I've always been making movies. It's always been something that I've done. And uh, in high school, I got to that point where it was like, all right, am I going to go into science, go into physics, or am I going to chase the arts? And I said, well, let's see where I get into. Let's see how colleges sort out. And I got into the USC's film program, as as they call it, the Harvard of Film Film Schools. Um, It's not, but, you know, it's fun to think. I know. A little. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> uh, yes, you have. You have. Uh, but, you know, at that point, it, it was sort of that idea where it's like, OK, if if, um, if if they let me in, then I guess I'm on par, at least, you know, I, I, I guess I'm close. And so at that point, I just said, you know what, this is something that I love and I want to I want to take a shot at it. And so that was that was kind of how I, you know, started. And after four years of film school and, uh, you know, then spent a, a few months after and then start on this movie right after that. And it's been about two years since then. What was the biggest thing you learned in film school and was it worth it? <laughs> That's two separate questions. <laughs> two separate questions. <laughs> what, what I learned was it wasn't worth it. Um, so I, I thought I, I think I'll answer was it worth it first, because I think the most interesting and worthwhile part of of the film school wasn't so much, you know, the classes or the facilities, or the things that they kind of like to advertise. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the most valuable part for me was I grew up in Texas. I, I, you know, spent 18 years of my life in Texas. I, you know, or 15, I, you know, I started there, I grew up there. And especially, you know, 10 years ago, uh, Texas didn't really have a film industry besides Austin. And, you know, I, I was up in Fort Worth and the Dallas Fort Worth area. So there, there wasn't a huge film education thing happening there the internet, you know, I I couldn't really stream YouTube in my house. So, you know, it wasn't happening. And so to be able to go to LA and just do a total immersion into Hollywood and and the whole shebang was was hugely beneficial for me. And and the school did a good job of sort of, you know, conveying that and, you know, not giving it to me all at once and, you know, blowing my head up or whatever. Um, So I I think that was the biggest value to film school, at least, was Mm -hmm. that. And and then the friends I made there, the connections, you know, that half the people on The Last Whistle uh, are USC people. Mm -hmm. um, And they're all, you know, early 20s. You know, they're they're not far out of school. They were the people I came up with. Um, And I think I think the biggest thing that I learned at the school was it, it doesn't matter when it comes to movie making. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how good of a writer you are or what the, your stats are. It, it's all about how hard you try. And and I think that that's something that Indie Film Hustle is all about. But honestly, you, you can be in the Harvard of film schools and, and the valedictorian 
is no better than than number 150 out of 150. But it's mm-hmm. all who tries is who actually, you know, I, I, I've been happy to work with for sure. You mean who hustles? Hustles. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> go, go back and just edit hustle and everything. You know, right? <laughs> exactly. It's all about who hustles. Yeah. Now, uh, tell me about your film, last, The Last Whistle. Okay, so The Last Whistle is a uh, sports drama. It's very much in the vein of Friday Night Lights. Uh, we are doing day and date release. It's, uh, you know, of course, it's about 90 minutes. It's, you know, very, a very simple movie, but really tried to uh, make it exciting and really make it uh, up the production value as much as I could. Um, it's basically what happens to a coach after one of his players collapses during practice. And so it's a lot of the stuff that that I feel like you hear about in the news from time to time mm-hmm. where a football player or a soccer player or a cross country runner collapses. I mean, and then they don't know why it happened. Everyone's kind of hurt, you know, shattered by this. And it's super tragic. And so just, you know, I, I played four years, five years of football. I played on a championship team in Texas and um, going through that and seeing that happen at so many schools and so many different sports around the area. It was something that affected me. And so when it came to this first movie, I started to think, all right, you know, um, what, what's something that's scary? What's what's a good hook? And, and that was what jumped out at me. That's like this used to scare my pants off and still does, you know. So do what all the great filmmakers do and make a movie about it. Yeah, it is a pretty scary topic uh, in, in general. And I've seen, you know, I remember when I was in high school and had to do with that, you know, they, they work you. And I was in Florida, so they worked you. And the, the oh, heat and everything. Yeah. And they think, and they think that, you know, because they're 18, they're, you know, they could just keep going and going and going, but they are human. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's, a, there's all sorts of different aspects to it. And, and, you know, I won't put the, the cart before the horse here, but we, we did one of our big marketing things that, you know, is totally self-generated was let's get in with the heart association. Let's, let's work with some nonprofits that deal with this Smart. sort of thing. And so we've really tried to sort of, you know, cross collaborate on, on those uh, sides of things to, you know, raise awareness about it and actually kind of add a social uh, commentary to the, to the film. Yeah. So what I, what I find fascinating about your movie and the way you made it, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to get more into detail about it is that you, you you were thinking about this as an entrepreneur. You were thinking about this as a holistic project in many different avenues, as opposed to just, Hey, I'm going to make some art. We're going to go do some stuff and we'll see if we can make some money at the end of it. You were actually, you really thought about this and you actually do a lot of the stuff that I talk about on the podcast, which is like, Hey, to connect with some people like, you know, organizations, get into a niche, you know, who are the audiences that you can reach out to, you know, what, who is the demographic for this film? You know, this is obviously it can range into faith based, but people who like Friday Night Lights, who people like uh, high school football movies, you know, and then just dramas and things like that. But you really have thought about this. And that's a, it's a great, uh, great example. I'm telling you, brother, it, this is indie film hustle, the movie. I mean, every every piece of it. I mean, it was, it was it's partly that it's a lot of it has to do, too, with um, Jason Brubaker, who you've interviewed, mm-hmm. I think, three times at this point, who, yeah. who runs Distriber. And uh, while we didn't end up going distribution through Distriber, Jason's a guy that I admire and I've met at a couple different things. I did AFM for the first time and saw him there and, sure. you know, all, all the places that Jason pops up, I've made sure to go and, and find him. And uh, it, there, there's, it's the calculator thing that he talks about where it's like, figure out how much you're going to make per sale, figure out how many people need to buy the movie and go find those people. You know, you're, if you get 50 people to buy based on a news article, go, you know, get 100 news articles wherever they are. You know, you, you have to you got to make these numbers up because you're only going to get so much from the storefront, uh, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, that's kind of what drove it alongside. It was just, you know, I, I got I, I want to get people to the door. I want to get a lot of people to see this movie. And then I had seen a lot of, you know, I, I think one of the most common film school movies um, and, and it's not a bad thing, but I think one of the most common first features for a, for a filmmaker, it starts off with three words, coming of age. And, and whenever I hear those three words, I just think, all right, first feature, you know, that's, that sounds like it to me. And so, um, and again, there's nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that, that it's common, that, 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 that it happens a lot. And so, you know, I, I, nothing with making a good or a bad coming of age movie, um, but the marketplace for coming of age movies can only handle so many movies. And so I almost look at it as like, I'm walking into a casino, I'm walking up to the roulette table and, uh, you know, would I rather bet on a color or am I going to bet on a number? 
And, you know, for anyone who knows roulette, a number is a one in 36 chance, a color 50 50. And so that's kind of the whole idea with this movie was how do I bet on the colors instead of the numbers? How do I increase our margin for success? Yeah, it's kind of like the are you familiar with the blue ocean, red ocean strategies? No, I'm not. All right. So the Blue Ocean, Red Ocean strategy is based on a book called Blue Ocean, Red Ocean. Um, and it's basically when you when like so perfect example, independent film will go a uh, horror movie. So okay. let's say, well, this is really affordable. Everyone makes a horror movie, right? Well, that mm -hmm. way we, we consider the horror movie a red ocean. That means that there's blood in the water and there's a lot of competition. You want to go into a blue ocean where there's less competition or preferably nobody's there. So when you make a faith-based or, you know, you know, football movie at a high production value, the competition for that kind of movie is going to be a lot less. Hence, you can raise your rates, you can raise your money. You make another horror movie, there's a million of those out there. So then now if you're going to do a horror movie, you got to go niche. So like Hatchet, I always mm -hmm. loved Hatchet because Hatchet was like, Oh, we're the American slasher movie. So like, uh -huh. and then there's subgenre, like there's torture porn and well, all these well, other kind of- It's Vegan Chef is what it is. It's the You're Vegan Chef. It's Vegan Chef. <laughs> it's the Vegan Chef. I've never had someone call me back out to that. I appreciate that. Oh, I, uh, the second I heard that, I was like, why do, you know, why is there not a, a required reading for every kid in film school about the vegan chef? The vegan chef movie. It's a, I have to make the vegan. I've spoken about the you vegan do, chef. You do. I have to I make mean, the I vegan mean, chef I mean, movie. You, 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 and, and I think part of it too is, I mean, again, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but a lot of the last whistle was, uh, oh, what's the word for it? Teleological. I, mm -hmm. Teleology, I think is the word for it. And it's all about the study of ends. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a teleologist, you study the apocalypse, you study, you know, the end of you study the end of the world, you study these things. And so on a smaller scale, the last whistle was totally reverse engineered. It was I, I, I want a movie that distributors will at least be interested in. You know, it doesn't have to go traditional distribution, but I want something that they would be interested in. Mm -hmm. Something that's marketable, something like you said, that that feels new, but it's got something old to it. You know, kind of Scott Derrickson's 2575 is, or 5050 mm -hmm. is what, what he what he calls it. And, um, you know, and so it was really that idea of where do I want to be? Not so much, you know, what do I have? It was a little bit of both. What do, where do I want to be and what do I have at my disposal? And so that was the whole thing was it was like, you know, uh, the, the teleology of, of, you know, I, I want to end up with, you know, something that really uh, changes what people are expecting. Yeah, you built you built a movie. Uh, you you came at it like a blueprint almost as opposed to just like, hey, I'm just going to get a whole bunch of wood and some nails. And, uh, so so we'll Matt, and let's see what happens. Yeah. You actually yeah, constructed yeah. like, no, I'm not only going to figure out how to build this thing, but I, I, I'm going to have a, a, a buyer for this thing before I get done with right. it. Well, well, I'll tell you what, what, what kicks me into that. And I'm sure, you know, everyone in the, in the tribe will know an experience like this. It's, it was a bad experience and a, a bad experience was what showed me, oh, a blueprint's a really good idea. And, you know, I can talk about it, you know, with, with a light heart because it wasn't, my project. It was just something I was helping out on. And, and it was a project that we really, you know, I, if there was a blueprint, I was the one trying to be like, Hey, wait, here's, we, we should, we should blueprint. And what, hap we should and what happened to that one? Uh, not much, you know, it's not much. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of time <laughs> and money was wasted. Whatever you think happened is what happened. Mistakes, you mistakes know? were made. Mistakes were made. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it was at the end of the day, it was, it was, a half built house and a lot of nails and boards that weren't ever going to fit in that house. And, and you can't sell a half, half built house. No, not in this market. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 20 years ago, South Korea videotape backyard. They, they, they could have, they, maybe, but not in this market. Um, all right. So how did you raise the money? The budget for this was about how much? A uh, hundred thousand. About a hundred thousand, right? So that's not a that's not a micro. It is a micro budget in the grand scheme of things, but for a, a normal guy like you or I, pulling a hundred extra grand out of our pockets is a it's a bit much. So how did you raise the money? Uh, a lot of different places. I mean, just really had to start a lot of different places. Um, so I, I think that's that that's such an important question. It's such a crux of what people ask. And I and I think I, I, before I kind of go into it, I, I think sort of the mindset and the the helpful part that that you've already kind of hit on was we had the blueprint whenever we were going out for financing, and so we had this blueprint of all right, here's what the independent film landscape looks like. 
you know, here's where our film is a micro budget film. Um, and then here's where we can lose money if we do it wrong. You know, we were very forthcoming with the investors saying, here's what we're worried about and here's where, how we're going to try to mitigate that. Um, so I, I think the blueprint was was the biggest piece of that. The blueprint was, um, you know, 100,000 is not a little, but it's not so much that we can, uh, you know, uh, get get caught off balance, you know, overcommit, you know, spend too much. Um, I, I had researched a couple other films. I mean, I've, I've been following like Thunder Road is a film I've been following very closely, not in the sense that we're the same as them in any mm -hmm. way. I mean, they mm -hmm. really did a good job with the festival circuit and knew mm -hmm. their audience and we have very different audiences. But I followed them and I, and I followed them in terms of, OK, how much money had they been able to get with the resources they had? You know, how did their storefront deliver? And then I just started calling up other directors and I say, hey, how much money have you made? You know, I mean, and and they, you know, it never in a way where it was like, give me an exact number. But it was always how did iTunes go for you? How did Amazon go for you? Did it? Did you get a streaming deal? How much was that worth? And, you know, of course, listening to your guests on the show. And so it's very hard. It's very hard to get those numbers. The Creative uh, Institute at Sundance is trying to make that a little more mm -hmm. transparent. Um, and they're awesome in that way. I mean, I'm so excited to see all the stuff that they continue to put out. Um, but I kind of was able to go into to investors with those numbers and say, hey, here's what the numbers look like. Here are your odds of success. Here's how we're going to try to increase those. Um, we went to production companies. You know, we went to some some uh, B level groups, and a lot of them said that you know it's uh, you, you you guys don't have any prior work. You know, you're you're all just out of film school, and even though it's USC, it's it's not enough for us to feel confident in. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's just the way it goes. And we were expecting that, so we went we went to I think we're between eight different private investors um very spread out you know none of them feeling too like it's you know no one no one cashed in all of grandma's retirement savings or anything like that which was right. which was good and and we we each one of them had a different ask and one or two of them just were, were, were wanting to be a part of it and the whole goal was what what can i do for you you know mm -hmm. this is this is a movie you don't normally invest in movies but you know if this excites you we, we want to work with you on it and and that was that was kind of how we we built the financing. Now, what um, you were talking earlier a little bit about the budget levels, like, a, you know, ten thousand dollar movie, fifty thousand dollar movie, hundred thousand dollar movie. What is the difference in your eyes and, and the difference? So, obviously, besides yeah, financial, I, I think that there and, and, and I'm sure you know this, but I, I think there's a huge difference in the hundred thousand and under range that indie filmmakers don't realize. Mm -hmm. And I, I see a lot of indie filmmakers who spend a hundred thousand dollars on a movie that should have cost ten, <laughs> yeah. and then a lot of indie filmmakers spend ten on a movie that really needed a hundred, and then in the end you've got fifty, and, and then in the middle you've got fifty, and those filmmakers can go both ways, and both you know budgets can go towards those filmmakers, um, and I, I think that you know whatever your budget is, you should really know. Um, I mean, where you're going to spend money, where you're not going to spend money, you know, that that's that that can get pretty complicated. Um, but I, I think that one of the biggest things that I see and, and I'm sure you've seen, too, is um, at these lower budget levels, filmmakers feel like they have to do everything in one location. Mm -hmm. They feel like it has to be a bottle episode. It has to take place in one location. Um, and I think you're I think that you can really shoot yourself in the foot when you do that. Um, that was something I was really excited about with Last Whistle was we we have, you know, 15 locations minimum in the film. I mean, it, this movie travels. You don't feel like you're in one place the whole time. And the fear always is, well, we've only got this amount of money, so we, we can't afford a company move. We can't afford the time it takes to go from one place to another. Um, but I think I think you increase the production value of your movie so much oh. if you can add some other locations in there. Yeah, and, with, with that question. Yeah, and and I think ten thousand is the only budget level where you can say, you know what, let's keep it in one place, you know, or or maybe if you're if you're in the hundred thousand, fifty thousand range, but it's an action movie and you're dealing with stunts or controlled, you know, explosives or something like that. Like, okay, I can see needing to stay in one location for something like that. Um, but the single location movie is, has 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 been done so frequently that it, you can risk losing hundreds of thousands of dollars if you feel like that's the way you have to do it. Um, and so that's that's sort of the thing that I've seen is, you know, if, if you're going to spend six digits on a movie, 
try not, you know, don't do it in one place unless you absolutely, it's mandated by the script, I think is the way that I would put that. Yeah, I mean, and with my film, my last film, On the Corner of Eagle and Desire, we did that for about 3,000, but it was it was done at, yeah. the, at the Sundance Film Festival. But the thing well, was that there was tremendous amount of production value and every five yeah. minutes we're moving. We're somewhere else, yes. we're moving here. So it actually had probably like 20 locations when it was all said and done. Yeah. So it added a tremendous amount of production value uh, to do well, that kind of film. How it, that's how we use, so, so we shot, you know, the kind of the next question is, you know, how'd you do it? How'd you, you know, get mm. keep the production value low? We we shot at my high school. Uh, we, right. you know, I, I called them up. I said, hey, listen, I know there's a week where the students aren't in class and it's not a holiday or anything like that. Can we, do you mind if we shoot there as long as we've got our, you know, location insurance, pay the security guards over time, that sort of thing. And they were super awesome. They were super awesome, inviting, and and it it kind of played into okay. I know how many families are at this high school who would watch this movie. So here's another audience that we can use. And um, this this high school was awesome because it gave us everything from offices to the football field to the locker wow. room. And it kind of turned into this mini, you know, uh, not soundstage, but it turned into like like a studio lot in a way. And mm -hmm. so we would have what, you know, a quote unquote company move, but we were moving from building A to, to building B. Sure. And, but you still feel like it's a whole new place as long as you, you know, hide it with production design, essentially. Yeah, that's the same thing that happened with us. We were just constantly moving to different locations throughout the whole piece. And it was literally a block away or literally you yeah. know, next door. But it seems like, boom, it's like this entire new world. Uh, and that's the key. I think I've done that with a bunch of my movies where I've, I've been in one location, but I can probably get 20 looks 20 scenes yes. that are completely distinctive and makes it feel much larger than it is. But it really was just like, let's just walk down the hall. And it's like Absolutely. a completely new world. So yeah, that's, a, that's great. And at any time you can get a location like a high school, which you have complete control over, you can create a ton of production value because there is a ton of production value there. Mm -hmm. Without it's, question. It's all about, you know, just, just, Make the, I, I think the hardest part is, you know, don't do it in LA. I think that's when yes, it comes to do it. challenging <laughs> locations, <laughs> uh, they will, you know, they'll ask for your checkbook minute one when you're in oh, LA, God. but, but if, if you're outside of LA and you've got a personal connection somehow and, and you, you not only say you're not going to damage anything, but you actually do it. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's another thing too, where it's like, you need to, re you know, you need to know everyone on your crew and you need to make sure that while, yes, you as the director or producer or writer will respect the space, that right. your gaffer will respect the space. And right. you're not going to see something with a C stand. And, you know, and, and that was, that was, you know, I was the last one on set every day cleaning up, you know, water bottles. Absolutely. And, and, and everyone was like, well, we're coming back first thing in the morning and they're not going to be here overnight. So who cares? And I was like, I care. God forbid the person that, you know, let us use this room it comes comes to find all these water bottles everywhere. Like I want them to I want them to like us when we leave. So in other words, you weren't wearing your ascot and your monocle uh, with a blowhorn as a director? What, well, <laughs> I, I put the monocle in my front pocket and then okay. I clean up the water, you know, and then <laughs> I put it. <laughs> then, you, then you put it back out and then the ascot's there all the time, generally, just because well, it's. Yeah, it, well, I mean, you can clean sweat with it. It's it's the ascot is <laughs> multifunctional. <laughs> That's it genius. works very well with the Hawaiian shirt too, which yes, is you know. I've never you seen always wear it. No, I've never seen an ascot with a Hawaiian shirt that I have not seen. <laughs> yet. Now, how did you get your talent? You have a, you have a fairly uh, you know great great cast. Sure. So the the hardest part with the talent I thought was going to be the money. I thought the hardest thing was going to be. You know, we've got this movie We're we're attaching talent. We have, you know, I thought the hardest thing to say was going to be we, we're, we're not done with the investment yet. You know, we're not done getting the money yet. Um, we, we started casting with probably 40 to 50 percent of our investment uh, in the bank. And so I thought that was going to be the, the hurdle. But uh, no one asks to see your bank account. No one demands, you know, you you put a cashier's check into them uh, for, for the most part. I mean, unless you're getting too high for, for who you should be going after. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really realized was the hardest thing was, you know, uh, as, as long as they like the script, which is huge, as you know. The if if you have what you would call a bulletproof bulletproof screenplay, mm -hmm. you have been hustling on that screenplay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
they will read it and they'll say, this is, this is a great thing for me. I love this role, you know, and, and if they genuinely love the role, they will play ball with you. Uh, there are actors who will say, Oh, I love the role. It's so well written, but you know, they're not, they're just saying that, you know, you mean, no, in LA, no, <laughs> stop it. Stop it. You mean LA, they're not telling you the truth? Well, Tampa, <laughs> Tampa, anywhere, uh, Texas, anywhere. <laughs> uh, so, so you, you, you have to have that to start off with. If you don't have that, then, you know, that's why you're not getting calls back, I, I think, when it comes to attaching talent. Um, but the second thing is uh, they, they want to know your prior work, just like the production companies did. And again, with this movie, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a football movie that I had made before this, you know, this, this, right. this was going to be the football movie. You know, I, I didn't have uh, some award winning short film because, you know, to make a really good short film these days, it, it money helps. And I didn't want to go and spend 10 to 20 K on something that I knew couldn't earn its money back. Mm -hmm. Now there's nothing wrong with doing that, especially if you're aware of that going into it. Um, but I, I, that's just not my style. You know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm good at shorts, honestly. I, I think features are really where I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, so the hard thing was not having prior work to show the talent, the agents, the managers, the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Um, what we did have was a sizzle reel. I had gone to my brother's little brother's homecoming football game. I filmed uh, some stuff in slow motion threw some Friday night lights soundtracks over nice. it. Yeah. And, and there was our, you know, last whistle sizzle reel. And that's awesome. You it see? was enough. It was enough. It wasn't perfect. No one was like, Oh, you guys know how to make movies, but it was, I, I feel something. This makes me feel something. And, and so I'm interested. It was not shot beautifully. There was this production design was terrible, but they felt something. And that was just like a trailer. The, the, what you have to do when you want to convert someone to your side. Is um, it, and so, I was going to ask you this uh, to touch on the sizzle reel stuff, though. That's something that a lot of filmmakers don't understand about a sizzle reel. It's like in creating a sizzle reel, and and it's a and it's not, it's an inexpensive way to really give a feeling, a look, a vibe yeah. to your project, and it really makes people who are generally not very visual, especially financiers, they can't think visually. So if you show them something, even if it's a cut up, you, you use other movies. And cut uh -huh. up a, a fake trailer for your movie yeah. with Brad Pitt in it. it I mean, and you're yeah. not saying that Brad Pitt's going to be in it, but no. I've seen it done and I've cut it. It's kind of like a, a, a feel, a vibe. I'm like, this is just a vibe. We don't have Mr. Have, Pitt. Have you, have you cut sizzle reels for clients? Many times. Many oh, times. Cool. Back in the day. Back in the day, I used to cut sizzle yeah, yeah. reels. Uh, it was VHS. But back in the day, I would cut together. You know, I remember doing scenes from Seven and some, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of serial killer dark dingy fight club kind of vibes to yeah. put together for a, a, a project that had that kind of energy to it and they wanted yeah. it just it's you know 30 seconds 60 seconds 90 seconds tops uh so that's one way of doing it then shooting something like what you did which was kind of like a sizzle reel you actually shot footage but you put in copywritten music as a as a demo yes. Is and fine. that's almost as good as brad pitt i mean you you the fact that you the can production. go to a music library and pull anything I mean, yeah. everyone loves the the score to Friday Night Lights. Uh, Inception. I mean, that's on no. everything. Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption as well. That Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption Redemption soundtrack is on. You could literally insert Shawshank Redemption's music on almost any movie, and it will just just take it up to that next level. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it will. <laughs> it's, and, I've and, used it so many times on so yeah. many different reels and things. You're just like, God damn it, man! That that's a, just a good score. <laughs> yeah. And and, and and so I think all of this is circumventing the the obvious answer, which is you should get a casting director to do all this for you. You know, you, where's your casting director? And and I you don't I, have the budget even going into this project. I yeah, I didn't realize how expensive a really good casting director oh, was. Brutal. And and they they earn every penny of it. I mean, mm -hmm. because because they do amazing work, and they can they can they can they deal with the agents and the managers. They can get the talent to feel comfortable with you. So it was in the absence of that that we were, and and we did end up having a casting director who was awesome, and and brought in uh, Brad Leland at the end, and brought in Deanne Levine at the end. Uh, but they were they they worked more locally, and then they helped us go for our for our lead, which we still didn't have at that point. So, so in, I'm talking more about when we, we started by attaching Jim O'Hare, who we all know is Jerry from Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. and, and I had been keeping up with Jim in his career since Parks and Rec because like him, like Aubrey Plaza, like uh, a lot of the actors in the office too, you know, I'd watched those ensemble shows for so long and, and had really 
been able to figure out which members of the ensemble had this amazing, like star studded talent. And I'm almost bummed that Aubrey Plaza is blown up in the way that she has, because I, I knew she was there. But luckily, you know, uh, Jim wasn't, you know, his schedule wasn't full like hers was. And so we, st we, we started with Jim and we, we sort of packaged it like you would at an agency. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. And now back to the show. I started with my friends who I knew were kind of on the cusp of, you know, TV stardom. Then they talked to their friends. We brought in some of our executive producers, Eric and Sainty are fantastic. And they have hit that TV stardom and the movie stardom and there. So they had friends that they were able to go to. And so it was those personal connections and then showing who we had cast already mm -hmm. laid a really nice groundwork when it came to casting folks without a casting director and without prior work. You know, it's funny, uh, just to go back in the sizzle reel, do you know what Robert Rodriguez did for El Mariachi? No. All right, so when, when he was, when he was pin, pimping out El Mariachi around town, he had his short film Bedhead on a VHS. Then he oh. had cut a trailer for Mariachi. But what he did was he took the soundtrack of another trailer because of that, in those days they didn't they, it wasn't uh, they didn't do a lot of dialogue it was just all music and mm -hmm. Roger Ebert gives it five four yeah, two thumbs yeah. up that, that kind of stuff action yeah. packed all the way says you know Peter Travers from Rolling Stone the, don't forget the zooms you have like right. the zoom to the face right? right yeah so he just took that soundtrack and edited his movie off the soundtrack so when someone saw it they were like well this looks like a real movie it was it yeah. was pretty it was pretty genius it's things that I used to do back in the day when I was doing my demo reels, but he took it to another place with his feature. But yeah, well, sizzle it, reels are very powerful. The funny, the funny thing that you mentioned, uh, Double R, uh, Robert Rodriguez did the Rebel Without a Crew competition on El Rey. Yes, yes, and yes, I, yes. You had, uh, you had- uh, Two, uh, I, well, I've had, uh, I've had one, had Alejandro, and then I've, I've oh. met with Josh. I, took, I was on his podcast, and now I'm, I'm gonna have him on my podcast in the next few months. So I, I loved that show. I watched every episode. I, I did too. It's the best one. It's the best one of all of those shows. It's, it, yeah, it, it definitely, because, because Greenlight is, is just, you know, the Greenlight's got its own stuff. Hey man, I was in, I was in season two. I was cool. in season, I was in season two Very of Project cool. Greenlight. Five seconds, opening credits. Very nice. <laughs> I, so when it came to, so anyway, uh, Rebel Without a Crew, the TV show was, you know, most people say their first feature was a genus, it was genocized by uh, the Robert. book, yeah. but you know, the Rebel Without a Crew, the TV show was what made me go and write The Last Whistle. And so I initially wrote this as a $7,000 feature. How could about, you do this for you know, seven grand? That must have been, would well, have been impossible. You, you, I, I would go and shoot during the home, I, I would make the sizzle reel, all the football that was in the movie. And then I would shoot the coach at his home, getting phone calls from people and getting visited by people. Okay, while it'd be a different movie. It'd be a different movie. Yeah, right? it's 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 similar, but it it cuts out all the other characters essentially. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's total art house instead of you know sports with like a twinge of art house, which is I think what Lutz was trying to be. But anyway, that was the genesis of this project, and that's kind of what they told me was, how would you do this for seven thousand dollars? And I was like, you don't know me. Like, just give me a shot. Just give me a shot. And and they picked who they did, and and I thought Alejandro especially killed it on he that did. show. He it did. Is, it was. It, I, I found it so funny how on this third or fourth episode, he was telling the other filmmakers what gear to go grab from mm -hmm. the cart. You know, they had mm -hmm. like the cart or whatever. Yeah. He's like, no, 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 you don't need a C stand. Like, like get get the light stand, get the light. You know. And and so I, I thought that was hilarious. Um, yeah. And his new movie coming out, Millennium Bugs, is coming out soon. It's. Oh, I, I saw him. his trailer, dude. It looks awesome, dude. And he Ooh. made it for like under under hundred, and it looks great. Looks really That's really great. Good for him. Anyway, that was the genesis of the last whistle, and and they turned it down. And when they did, I said, "Let's go make it ourselves." Fantastic, man. Now you also reached out to distributors before shooting. I did. Wow! Um, amazing. That was another one of your episodes. I don't know which one it was, but but I'm sure it was. I don't remember who that was, but uh, uh, yeah, you know where I got that idea. Yeah. So so you went out to a distributor, you talked to them, and like, look, I'm making a football movie. What do you need in here? How did you, how did that process go? 
just just like casting more difficult than than I expected. Um, it, it was kind of crazy how how few distributors would email me back and who how few of them would actually reply to someone who's essentially a future customer, you know, someone who's going to go and do all the legwork for them. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. um, I was I was kind of shocked that the, these very middle level distribution companies were not paying me the time of day to just pick up the phone for 10 minutes. Sh- shocking. You know? Shocking. I, yeah, yeah, shocking. Yeah. Shocking. So <laughs> here I yeah, here I am just with, with my lofty ideals for humanity and maybe maybe well, you're, in the, you're in the wrong that. business for that, my friend. I hate to tell <laughs> you. Try San Diego, I guess. <laughs> um, but you got a few that called you back. Eventually. Yeah. So so eventually uh Josh Spector at Gravitas at the time mm-hmm. uh said, I, I I'll give you ten minutes, and, you know, as long as you're not trying to sell me the movie, you know, I'd go through the usual channels for that. And I was like, No, 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 it's not like we don't we don't need pre sales, we don't need this stuff, just you know, ten minutes is, is perfect. And Josh was nice enough to pick up the phone and tell me, you know what, just you're doing football, make sure it's got a ton of football, especially in the first five minutes. Um, make sure that your key art and your onset photography is excellent. Um, we need a lot of options when it comes to art. Um, he said, you know, make sure that you've got very high production value enough to where you can cut a really good trailer with. Um, and, and he just talked about, you know, the, the, the make sure that if you have a lot of football, the football's forefront. If you end up getting a big actor that they are front and center. Um, but I think the main question I went into Josh with was I said, here's our budget and we and we're not sure if we're going to get a big actor. Can we make it work? And he said, if it's football, you you can make it work. If it's not, it won't. You know, a drama that's made for 100 K, I don't think will make its money back. No. Um, and I, I'm paraphrasing that those aren't his, ex- no. you know, his opinions or beliefs or anything that has to do with uh, where he is now, which is uh, vertical entertainment. Um, but that was that was the gist of kind of what he he told me and his publicly available knowledge and 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 eventually he he phoned me back he emailed me back about five or six months later and said hey did you guys finish the movie you know i we vertical would love to take a look at it and at that point that's where the, the ball started rolling and he ended up being our our uh, uh, acquisitions he, he he acquired us so isn't it, it, isn't it funny so so you mean to tell me because i just i gotta lay this out for everybody listening yeah, yeah. so you mean to tell me that you call up a distributor and go hey i just want 10 minutes of your time I, I'm, I'm thinking about making oh, we're gonna go make this movie i would love to hear your thoughts on what we need to make this movie sellable and marketable for you and, and with your wealth of experience and years of experience and then you st- he stated he was impressed enough with you that he re- he went or called you back or emailed you back five or six months later and said Hey, whatever happened to that football movie? I'm over at this new place. And why don't you come over here? And then that turns into your distribution deal. Yeah, pretty, essentially. Pretty, pretty much it. Shocking. Shocking. <laughs> Shock. It's amazing what happens when you actually just do this kind of stuff. Like it's <laughs> it's, it's one thing. Look, I I preach about this stuff every day, all the time, but yeah. it's just very few people want to do the legwork. And because if not, this is what would have happened. You would have made your movie and what? You would have then tried to make your movie and then you would have started calling everybody and then you would have gotten all sorts of horrible deals if anyone would have called you back. And it's and you would just like you would be rolling the dice. You'd be betting on the number, not on the color. Basically. Exactly. You're yeah. trying to stack the odds against uh, for you as much as you can against the house. As, and as and I think there's an interesting thing when it comes to film festivals. I think this is a good point. To throw yeah, I was gonna, that was my next question. Yeah. Um, the so my thesis going into this movie, you know, I I did have some the, some theses going into this movie. I said I I think you know I I think this will work. I think this will work. I think this will work. Here's the evidence, and then let's test it out. Let's do the scientific you know uh, the scientific process with it. And so my thesis going into this was. Film festivals have way too much uh, bearing on on the sellability of a film. People put way too much weight on a festival because of because of the nineties, because, because of the nineties, because of the nineties. That's when they 90s. did. They actually did have power. You know, Sundance. You won Sundance. You got a you got that check from Harvey. Yeah, yeah. I know he's not a cool name to say right now, but you got that name. You got my Aramax to show you, up. And- you don't want. You, I would. I would cash that check if you if you get a check from Harvey now. I would make sure that doesn't bounce because I don't. <laughs> exactly. I don't- <laughs> exactly. But back then, I mean, in, yeah. there, there was a probably around a six or seven year period that that's that festivals were powerful. You know, and some still are, of course. I mean, you went Toronto. Absolutely. You went Cannes, you went, you know, maybe Tribeca or you went South by. 
th- that does bring in certain amounts, but that's such yeah. a small, small amount well, of films. And so my thing was, okay, we're a Texas film. Should we try Should we wait that's until what, March to go South, for South by? Right. And, and in the end, we, we didn't apply to South by, we didn't apply to Sundance. I wanted to keep it grassroots. I wanted to go where I knew the numbers were, where I knew that we had the 50, 50 odds instead of the one in 36. And so we debuted at the Lone Star Film Festival in Fort Worth where we filmed it. And we nice. had a huge opening night crowd, lots of local press. And and what we did there was we started our, our audience. I mean, you know, we, we started building our audience there. And and we got to do that in November instead of March. Um, whereas if we had if we had gotten into South by and done March, um, we would have had to wait until football season 2021 to get the movie out there because mm-hmm. you can't release this movie in, you know, the winter time. It's, it's got to be right. football season. Sure. And, and so that was that was, again, that teleological thinking about the end, you know, really trying to land the plane 100 miles away instead of, you know, just slam it down in the runway, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that was my thesis going into it. Now, I think an interesting thing that I will be the first to admit is what I was wrong about was the same thesis that I had about a, a, a name for a movie. You know, my mm-hmm. thesis when it comes to names is a, a name does not guarantee you a good movie in any way. And on mm-hmm. top of that, a name does not guarantee you money. As we as we saw with um, not Manchester by the Sea, but uh, was it by the Sea, the Brad Pitt, Joel, Jolie? Yeah, the, of course. Yeah, they, that, the yeah. one that yeah. Angelina, I think she wrote and directed that one. Yeah, yeah she did. Yeah. And and the movie did not do well. I mean, it had Brad Pitt. It had the the and you Brad know, Pitt the, and Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie, yeah. And and so I, I think you know, seeing movies like that, it's like names. But what I realized is that names and festivals are very similar in the way that it. That is how distributors know best how to sell a film. And so if you come to a distributor with, hey, we don't have a name or or festival laurels, but we've got these other marketable things. While they might agree with you that those things are marketable, it doesn't fit their system of here's where we put, you know, here's where we insert the name into our trailer. Here's where we put the name on our poster. You know, they have to put a lot more legwork into, okay, how do we put these marketable aspects into our framework of how we distribute films? Mm -hmm. And so I think that was my that was the one difficulty when it came to festivals was people were surprised when they watched the movie. And, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. And I'm going to hear it a hundred times again, but people go, oh, that was a lot better than I thought it would be. And, and um, you know, whether they're giving it a six out of 10 or an eight out of 10 or a nine out of 10, um, they came into it expecting three or three or four out of 10 because it didn't have a laurel on it. Mm-hmm. And, and I kind of have to be like, oh no, no, we, we, we didn't, we didn't want to forefront the laurels because that's not our audience. And that boggled people's minds. They were like, what do you mean you didn't do film? What do you mean you didn't do the festival circuit? You know, yada, yada, yada. And, um, and it's just a, it's just a new way of thinking and it's a much more difficult one to pull off. Um, but you, you know, better than anybody, you, you know, best, no. not necessary. Agreed. And festivals aren't necessary and, and they're nice. And if you've never done the experience, it's a great experience. You meet a lot of cool people. You meet a lot of filmmakers, you know, you might get a little press, you might get an award or two, your ego might get stroked. You might get a red carpet, some pictures, but that's essentially it. Even if you get into one of these big ones, it's no guarantee. I know many filmmakers yeah. who, who want Sundance and did nothing for their careers. You know, mm-hmm. it all depends but, on the kind I, of project. When I saw like Jim Cummings and Vanishing Angle uh, and Thunder Road, when I saw Thunder Road, you know, get Grand Jury at South by and uh, and play at Sundance and all these things um, and then not take the deal with A24 or with any of these, you know, distributors that, that came calling and decide to self-distribute. That's when I was kind of like, wait a second, if if if, you know, Grand Jury at South by and huge grassroots indie audience doesn't get you the deal you want. Um, you know, I, I then there's no way that they're going to come calling for a for a football faith film. You know, like that. That's just not on the radar whatsoever. Right. And it's, a, but it's also like there's a there's a lot of people who drink drank this Kool Aid. A lot of filmmakers drink this Kool Aid of this kind of myth of and expectations of what winning a festival does or how things should be. And I do believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that a lot of these preconceived notions are myths of, of, of a long gone era, which are those 90s 
indie movies that, you know, that's kind of the beginning of the independent film movement, really. The independent film movie that we know today yeah. kind of started in the 90s, you know, started with, yeah. um, if you want to go way back, Hollywood Shuffle, 1987, Robert Townsend. Uh -huh. And then you go, and then you, and then Sex, Lies, and Videotape with Steven Soderbergh, and then that launched Sundance and, and so on and so forth. And people still think that that's the way things are made. It is not. It is not that world anymore. And no. the, the world has changed so dramatically. And I love to have you on the show for this specific reason too, that you are a different model and a new model of what's happening. And you know what, this model might not work in a year or two and we might have yeah. to switch again. You know, it could be another thing. So, it, but people got to get that out of their head, man. We're not living in well, 1990 I'm gonna, anymore. I'm going to inflate your ego here. Uh, oh no, please. Dangerous thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that, that back alley in Hollywood might have uh, an explosion. <laughs> in a couple seconds. The back be alley in Hollywood. The that week. Um, the, uh, th that's what I, that's what I really like about any film hustle and, and the other, uh, podcasts that are in this space is it's, it's, it is to the day current when it comes to what does our industry look like? Wh how is the best way to succeed today mm -hmm. versus what worked five years ago? Because I mean, it, it maybe in terms of the styles of movies five years ago can maybe be similar to now, but in the styles of distribution, it's just changing so fast that if if you're not staying like you know if you're not listening to indie film hustle every week you 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 are you have lost track of what is happening in distribution and indie film hustle and creative institute and all these other sources i mean it's so that that's what because like you know books take time and you know books used to teach you how to distribute a movie because oh, the no. information stayed the same for longer than than 12 months right um and that was the same way with our camera gear too we we shot on the the canon c300 mark ii Mm -hmm. Um, we had the option to shoot red. It was the same price just about. And, uh, and, and I kind in the DP, Brian Tang and I went into it and I said, you know what, Brian, like we're, we're making a football movie. Uh, our audience does not know the difference between red or Canon. They don't know the difference between anamorphics and, and spherical. Um, I want to shoot this on the camera that is going to run for the longest amount of time without charging. That's going to take up, you know, a super low card space. And that isn't going to heat up if we take it outside in the Texas heat in May and, and die on us. And that's not going to kill my MacBook Pro when I go and, uh, you know, do the first director's assembly and then hand it my off to our God. editor who's on it. And, 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 this is, and as I say this, I realize you said this on an earlier episode of the podcast. You were talking about shooting on something that doesn't crash your computer. Oh, I mean, just, I, it warms my heart. It really does warm my heart, man. Are, I you, say, are you having deja vu right now? No, of I course, mean. because it's basically everything I've ever preached. I'm like, guys, like, who cares? No one cares. Like, I shot my movie on a on a black magic pocket camera, 1080p, you know, and, and it looks fantastic projected, you know? It's like, God, Jesus, you, you mean, I don't know. It's, just, it's too it's too much. I can't take this. I can't take it. It's too much. <laughs> It's too You're much. Exploding. It's happening. I, it's exp I'm literally exploding because I'm like, <laughs> I, it, it, it bring it, it warms the cockles of my heart to, to hear <laughs> to hear this from a filmmaker that I'm like, oh, good, someone's listening out there to me, and it's not all about ego, and it's not all about I need to shoot this on a red or an Alexa. I'm like, no, man, my audience can't tell the difference. They both look really damn good. And what's gonna what's gonna run the longest? What's not gonna crash my my laptop when I'm working on it? What's gonna give me best bang for your buck, man? It's not always like I, right. I, I tell people. It's like, could I've shot Ego and Desire on an Alexa? Sure. Did I have access to one? Yeah, I could have probably gotten one if I wanted to, and I could have probably gotten away with shooting it all there if I if I truly wanted to. Is the Black Magic Pocket Camera the best camera in the world? No. But yeah. does it work? And it does it do exactly what I needed to do for that specific project? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's that's something that I that I, uh, you know, really I, I, I've even got a, an, an image for it. And it's sort of the audience's threshold of quality. And it's don't think about what your cinephile friends know about film that they're, they're going to see the lens flare. They're going to see the, the yep. piece of production design that's messed up. Yep. Think about mom and pop. Think about Uncle Joe. What are what will they notice and not notice? And I'll tell you what they notice is bad directing, bad writing, sound. Uh, and and bad sound. bad sound and so and and so i think the you know the 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 hard thing to accept here is if if you as a filmmaker are focusing too much on red versus alexa and this is something i see on uh, that facebook group movie set memes all the time if you're focusing so much on red versus alexa uh maybe it's because you don't know enough about what you should be focusing on to to focus on that instead 
And yeah. so again, it's it's go take a class, get be be a better director, be a better writer to a, to the point where you don't feel like because I had this I had this face. I mean, so so strongly for such a long time, it was I don't know how to make this any better, so maybe I can make it look better. And yes. as the director, that's not what you're there to do. You are there to make what's on screen better. Your cinematographer will make it look amazing. If you hire a, a good a good one, absolutely. Yeah, well, well, I I did. Brian yes. was kicked No, it off. looks great. It yeah. looks great. I have to say, it looks great. Thanks, thanks. Now, what was the distribution deal structure that you set up here? Because I'm really curious to see what kind of deal you got, and, and you said you would be more than willing to share this with the yeah. tribe. So, so I'll, yeah, I'll share all of the publicly available, you know, info just so I'm not, you know, stepping on any toes. Um, we're doing, uh, we, we've done a, uh, a day and date release. Um, so we, we blasted in 10 theaters um, mm -hmm. that uh, cost us some money up front or the, the distributor at least put some money up front for that. And what it allowed us to do was to debut in the in theaters now folder to debut it at a slightly higher premium price than elsewhere. Um, it, it helps us with airlines and with later windowing and, and international sales and things like that to show that, you know, the distributor had enough confidence in the film to invest early in it. Mm -hmm. And that that's kind of, in, you know, it's kind of in a similar way where it's like, oh, you didn't have a star, but they put it in theater. So so it must be worth something. You know, mm -hmm. they, they spend money on it. So it must be worth something. Um, so the day and date release is kind of the way that the, the distribution was structured. Um, we're working on a very standard distribution deal. There's there's a there's a distribution cut up front and then there's a um, there's a recoupment of expenses. And then there's uh, the our take after that. If the expenses uh, have been capped. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Um, I, and that, that actually came from a, a friend who had who had gone through a very uh, sad, very unfortunate distribution scenario. I'm sure you've never heard of that happening. Never, never. Uh, shocking. Shocking. <laughs> shocking. And, and they and, and he, he, he kind of told me he's like, you know, when it comes to deals that sometimes and, and usually the cap will be what what they're going to spend, you know, and, oh, and of so, course. And and so I kind of went into it knowing that and and and, you know, I we're, we're still waiting for and, and I mean, I, I, I do. I, I've been very pleased with how they've distributed and I think they've done a great job. And so I, I'm, I'm actually not in the school where I'm like, oh, they're totally going to screw us over. And I'm and I and I'm thrilled to be there. I'm, I'm thrilled that that we that I think we found a good one. You know, I think we. We, we did. We definitely didn't find a bad one. And, and when I get all the numbers, I'll be sure to come back to you or, you know, go to the Creative Institute and, and share as much as uh, the distributors comfortable with me sharing, because I think in a world with so many bad distributors, it's worth, you know, really praising the good ones and mm -hmm. praising the ones that do do good work uh, because because you want them to be in high demand. And and um, and I definitely want that for hours if that's the way that it that it turns out. But awesome. And then and then also uh, you've gotten a. A uh, streaming service deal as well. You got one of the big streaming service deals uh, got got picked up by one of them as well. Yeah, and so I, you know, can't obviously can't talk much about who it is or what it's it one, is. It's one like, of the big boys. One of the big boys. Um, what we what we noticed was, or what what I what, another one of the blueprint aspects that I that I looked at with this movie is, um, I was on an airplane, uh, as many of us are from time to time. And I started to look at what was in their content library and they had the, the film festival winners. They had the, you know, the, the big Hollywood movies, they had this and that. And then I go clink, 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 go all the way down to the bottom and they've got sports and there's one sports movie and it's the only category it's, it's the blue ocean. And it's like, Oh my God, they have, you know, like, Name a sports movie that came out this year. Uh, Free Solo. You know, it's kind of like that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't. There's not. Yeah, that's all. It's on iTunes right now. You know, and well, R.I.P. R.I.P. iTunes. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and so and so I I just I, I saw that blue ocean and and I said and and so then I went to the streaming sites after that and I started to look up. Okay, who's been selling to these streaming sites? Who's buying what? And then the most important thing for me was. Is there a big, you know, sports property that's recently left or taken a better deal with a different streaming site? Um, because what they like to do is if they can't have James Bond, they'll put the man from Uncle front and center. That way, if you if they have a customer that says, I love spy movies, I want to go I want to go see James Bond. They can be like, no, 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 wait, 
stay with us, watch Man from Uncle, you know, and, and I'm not even sure if that's on a streaming site, but if I was running one, that, that would be what I would put up to get, to keep people to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so that's, so that, what Netflix, that's what Netflix does when you like search a specific like Marvel movie, they'll put all the other Marvel movies that they might have access to, but it might not be the um, one that you're looking for. Right. And so, yeah, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Hulu, whether it's yeah. Crackle, whether it's any of them, it's, it's, they, they, they yearn, it, it's sort of that, that industry that used to exist of the mockbusters of, you know, the ones where it was, it <laughs> oh, was still, oh, still, Devils and oh, was it? Still I just exists. saw, I just saw now like, uh, the adventures of the Aladdin mysteries or something like that. Like it literally <laughs> just came out like a week ago. I'm like, Oh yeah. yeah. There's that company. I forgot what they do, but they just, that's all they do. It's just whatever well, the big Hollywood movie is to pop it out. It used to be very easy because you'd go to blockbuster and maybe blockbuster didn't have the sleeve for Avengers and they didn't have the sleeve for Avengers of Aladdin. You send Uncle Joe to Blockbuster, he brings just, home events of Aladdin, and you don't watch it, but they've already made their money. Yep. And and so it, that used to be, that's where it started. And then, of course, now it, it it's in full effect because you can design a poster that looks exactly like, I mean, to be fair, the there's that meme, the Aladdin poster looks just like the Force Awakens poster. I mean, you know, the blue and the red. And, oh, yeah. Was, I thought yeah. Thor, like when Avengers, like Thor Ragnarok came out, they just came out with a yes. Thor movie. And it says Thor Adventures or something like that. And yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Thor, you can say Thor is Thor. It's yes. yeah, not, he's, no he's trademark a, on Thor. Uh, there's, uh, there's no trademark. Yeah, there's no trademark there. Uh, so so I, I think that was I was looking for I was trying to look for a blue ocean in a in a streaming site. So smart. And and uh, and and I think that I think that that was definitely the major one of the major reasons behind why the one that picked us did. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, you know, uh, I'll take this time to say too. please go find Last Whistle on iTunes. Please go find us on, uh, you know, Amazon or Xbox or, you know, Google wherever Play, you wherever find us right now. Because because we really need the, the the tribe, we we desperately need the tribe because we we got to get those numbers up. It's it's all about the algorithm. It's all about you know mm-hmm. getting word out about the movie and and that that helps us. So we you know I, I don't know when that the whole streaming thing is going to come to fruition. So please don't don't hold out for that. Please go check the movie out. Just rent it for you know whether it's three bucks or five bucks or whatever it is. You know mm-hmm. rent it. I will I will send you a dollar, two dollars, whatever you need to feel better about your your purchase. But uh, but we but we really need the tribe to help us out right now. It's that's that's huge. Yeah. Now, how did you get the word out on the film, or how are you getting the word out on the film? Uh, uh, sort of going back to that blueprint. Uh, the blueprint has a bunch of different things that that allow sort of give us an in. So we started with um, Fort Worth, where we filmed it. We we're, we're working with all of the people that helped us film there. We're sending them posters and trying to say, hey, you know, get people to like this. Um, you know, it's, it's a very much a Facebook based campaign because our audience demographic is is older, um, not, you know, uh, Snapchat. Elderly, but but they're not as young as Snapchat or Instagram, um, which is better for us, because I, I think while Facebook pages has its drawback. It's made a very nice platform for uh, the generation that we're trying to reach um, and because they are very active on and, and I know they're active because I, I uh, Facebook is my favorite. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm an old soul at heart. You know, I don't the, the newfangled things are not the new you know, fangled the, things. Bang, there it is. Bang. Yeah. The new the fangled, fangled things. Listen yeah. to you. You're talking like you're my age. Yeah. <laughs> what are you? What are you? 29? 28? Uh, God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. And then boom, the head explodes. Then the, the head explodes. Yeah. God bless you. You think I'm 29. Um, <laughs> my God. I, could I watched the keynote. I, I know how old you are. Oh my God. Can you imagine the damage I could do if I was in my 20s? Oh my God. <laughs> With my mind to Oh my God. The damage. There's the mob would shoot a movie uh, for you. Yeah. It's exactly the mob would shoot a movie for me at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cool, man. Now, another thing I wanted to ask you real quickly is the business model you're trying to build here. You're, you're trying to build, this is not a one-off. You're trying to do multiple films like this and you're actually through your production company, through what you're trying to do, you're trying to build a business model that you can replicate on film after film after film. So you could actually, God forsake, make a living in this business. You mean you're going to survive and thrive in this business? Please explain to people what are you trying to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I oh, make a living. That's real. Oh, interesting. That's very interesting. That's, that, that's a great, that's a great idea. That would be, Isn't it? That would very, be great. very admirable idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, 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 that's the, I mean, the, the whole goal with this movie is it's not about this movie. It's about the next one. 
because while making that first movie is hard, once you do it, the hardest thing becomes the next one. And that's what I've heard from everyone that's, that's gone and done their first feature. You know, I, like I said, I, like I told you, I called up all the directors who had just done their first feature who, you know, were, were super helpful. And, and, and I, uh, one of them was uh, Morgan Dameron, who um, you recognize that name because it's Poe Dameron, it's last name from Star Wars. And she was assistant to J.J. Abrams for a number of years. And, and she left Bad Robot and went and did her first feature. And she was hugely helpful to us in making That's awesome. um, Last Whistle because she she, call, she she would stay on the phone with me for an hour, hour and a half, just giving me all the things. She was like, listen, you're going to have to do a dialogue continuity and spotting list. And it's hell, but but it but it's going to be worth it. And and she was very happy with Jason and Distributor, and they went with Distributor, and they self distributed, and and their movies called Different Flowers, so they're they're awesome. That's one definitely worth checking out. Um, and and she was one of those people who's very transparent with me, gave me a lot of info. And and as we ended the call, this was this was about you know a year, year and a half ago. She was she was I was like, what's what's going on now? And she's like, well, the hardest thing is that second feature. And so that almost planted a seed for me back then, where it's like, oh, that's that's crazy that you know it's it's. They, they did such a good job with this movie and it's still so hard to get that second feature. Um, and, and I, I know that she will. And I, 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 at this point she's doing TV and commercials and she's, she's doing fine. I mean, she, she's doing great. Um, but, but that, that's been my mindset this whole time is okay. How, how do you get that second feature? And, um, and so that's, that's the whole idea is let's, let's figure out a business model where we're not overextending anybody, where we're not going to burn any bridges uh, where we're never going to lose everyone's money and where we really give the opportunity to to really blow up. And if it's not the last whistle that blows up, say the last whistle goes and does our medium range expectations, um, then, you know, we're, we're still kind of ahead of the pack there. We're still kind of like, oh, wait a second. We we, we can take this to someone that wants to make a five percent return on investment or wants to lose 10 percent of an investment and, and, and be an executive producer on a movie. And say, hey, here are the numbers. Here, here's what we can and can't do. Um, and so, so it, this movie is almost there, so I can just have numbers. So I can just, you know, take numbers. Proof of concept. To, it's a proof of yeah, concept. Yeah, very much so. And so, so you know, as it go, as we go into our next movie, I, I think I'm gonna, I, I, I think I'm gonna go. I wasn't sure if I was gonna do this. Uh, I, I don't know if it's where I'll be, you know, three months from now. Um, but I think for the next film. I want to do what we did with Last Whistle in the faith realm. Um, I, I think that uh, Last Whistle is very much a football movie with a very heavy uh, art house uh, structure to it. Uh, even though you wouldn't really know that, you know, you wouldn't think about that going into it, basically. Um, but it's I really tried to bring some very uh, classic filmmaking style into this mm -hmm. movie. And, and I, I, I think it's totally all under the surface. I don't think anyone really notices it. But I think that just like Kubrick did with 2001 A Space Odyssey, where he brought sci-fi from this sort of like B-movie realm into, oh, adults can watch science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think I'd like to and I think it's been done before a few times, but I think I'd like to bring that to the faith film uh, perspective because it, it, it's a realm where I feel comfortable telling an investor we, we've got a, a, an audience here, a worldwide audience that is worth this amount of money every year. And if we carve out this niche, then I think we can spend this much on the movie, you know, and just totally reverse engineer it that way um, and just work my way up in terms of budget level sizes until, you know, I, I've either had one do a great job or I've worked my way up enough to where, you know, maybe I don't have to produce my own stuff anymore. And I can kind of, you know, uh, go be a director somewhere or go be a writer somewhere and, and you know, produce whatever I want. That's that, that, that's kind of the game plan. The so, dream, the dream. The dream, the dream. Now, uh, you wrote a book as well. I did. Uh, I, you know, I, I knew I, I'd gotten so many uh, questions that were so similar so many times um, while making the movie. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the most common, of course, which is how did you raise the money and that sort of thing. And um, I, I got to the point where I had um, like forgot. I, I started to say different answers every time. And then I would I would say like the worst possible answer when I had definitely said the best possible answer in the past. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to write down all my answers. I, I want to have this in like a place where I can go like literally flip to it and, and figure out, oh, wait, what is my answer to this? What is the best answer I've ever answered for this? Because I didn't want to answer the bad answer anymore. And so I, I did a book. It is I got it right here. Rebel with a crew. Um I call it rebel with a crew instead mm -hmm. of rebel without a crew, um, because the thesis of the book is that 
the Robert Rodriguez movie, the El Mariachi, uh, doesn't really exist anymore. Um, in a, in a way Not that, that built way. A, a career. Um, his model, and, his model was very specific to him. Very much so. And, and it's, it's what you've talked about where it's like, yeah, they're the, for every, you know, Kevin Smith and for every Robert Rodriguez, there's, you know, X number of people that did the same thing and, you know, didn't have that person show up at their screening and yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, but, but the, the, the thesis with rebel with a crew is that if you've got a group of people around you, mm-hmm. um, a bunch of, you know, if 10 Robert Rodriguez's get in a room that they can do, they, they can achieve that, you know, whether it's 10, whether it's five, whether it's two, um, my thesis is, is the idea that the quality of, of films has gotten so good that you need help if you want to compete at the, at the minimal level. Mm-hmm. And, and whether that's, you know, it, actors or, or a sound person or whatever it is, um, that's that's the idea of having that crew. And that was the whole idea with uh, just upping the production value with Last Whistle. You know, Last Whistle wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have amazing cinematography, amazing sound, amazing acting. Um, Location. my, my brother's, Locations. My brother's helping me wrangle extras. Uh, a whole city of people coming out for one night to be a crowd at, at, at a football game. Um, you know, killer scheduling, killer uh, composition. Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting 10, 15 other people there, but it's it's all about, uh, the book is all about that crew. And it's all about just going through every step of the process from writing to directing to casting to, you know, all, all the the, sta- the pieces that, uh, that you that you normally would ask about. And then I've got chapters on distribution and marketing too, but um, those aren't done yet. Cause like, cause I don't, I don't have the numbers yet. And so yep. it's it's out on Amazon. It's called Rebel with the Crew um, and check it out. It's it's like half a book right now. And so I'm selling it for like a half a book price because it is definitely not finished yet. Um, but it's it's got enough information to at least, you know, do everything we've talked about, about going to the uh, the distributor beforehand and, and budgeting and keeping your Good costs you. and all that. That's stuff. awesome. That's awesome, yeah. dude. Now, I am going to ask you the questions I ask all of my guests. So you should. And for be, once, you got someone that's prepared for it. Maybe there's one, maybe a new one in there. There might be a new oh, one in there. I don't know. No, we'll see. No. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Okay. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Um, I had to think about this. This is the hardest one for me to answer. I did have to think about this one long and hard. Um, and I actually forgot that you that you asked about this one until recently. And then when I heard you ask it, I was like, oh wait, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I think my advice would be very bird's eye bird's eye view. Um, Hollywood cannot ignore someone who's making a profit. Yes, very true. Very, very true. So if, you know, not, if you have an idea or something that can, that can make money, you are 100% getting into Hollywood. If, if you're making money. Um, again and, agents, and again and again, well, even more so. Yes. Agents will line out the door to take 10% of that money. You know, it's, 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 it is, a, the, you know, it's totally the most foolproof way. Now, you know, obviously the, the idea to do that is hard and it might be, you know, it, you might not have that answer yet. But but if you can find that answer, it's going it, to it could save you a lot of uh, failure time. Now, now, can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact in your life or career? Uh, so it, kind of the, the 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 brother to Red Ocean, Blue Ocean, um, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. Yeah, great book. I love that book. Great book. And, and I, I just I, I love the way that that book talks about um, success as failure, you know, which is which is very easy. Uh, you know, that's a very common idea, but you don't you know, you don't see it like he talks about it in very you know, concrete ways. Um, he talks about uh, really just, you know, the, the 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 people that walked backwards while everybody else was walking forwards Um and just how to really, you know, apply those those mantras that you hear on, you know, inspirational quotes where it's like, don't do what everybody else does. Whereas, you know, I, I really like the way that, you know, MG takes it and he's like, no, 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 here, here's where someone didn't do what everybody else did. And here's why it doesn't matter. You know, here's why it doesn't sound like it does on those inspirational things. So Very cool. liar, also David and Goliath. David and Goliath is, is, that's, is another awesome. great, that's another great book. Um, now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether the film business or in life? Okay, so this one for me is that a larger number of people than I expected are not good at their jobs, and it's not because they lack the skill, it's because they lack the hustle. 
It's a good, and that's a good answer. I just, I, I, and whether it's your job or whether it's, you know, someone at the quote unquote Harvard of film schools that's, you know, just cruising their way through. Um, I, I think I'm always surprised by anyone in any profession who is just there because they have to be. Um, and I think that, that the lesson that took me the hardest, that took me the longest to learn there was just that, that there are lots of, there are lots of people that feel that way. And so. Okay. Good answer. Like the tribe, the tribe is motivated. What is the biggest fear you had to overcome with making this film? There's the new one. You got me. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to have to get, yeah, I got to give you a second. That one. <laughs> uh, total financial loss. Okay. That's a good, that's a very reasonable fear. Um, you know, what, and, and that, you know, in the beginning it took the form of, oh, we only shot half the footage and we're out of money, you know, uh, now it takes the form of, all right, what are the numbers going to look like? Or, you know, is, is, is the cap going to work, you know, and, and things, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but my biggest fear was having to go back to the investors and say, we lost all the money because no. I want to go back and tell them that, that we made their money back. I want to tell them that we made, uh, made, we, we, we made them all a penny, you know, that, that yeah. would be success. So my Fair fear enough. was a goose egg. Three of your favorite films of all time, sir. Uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. um, A New Hope, as as I you know came up knowing it, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, A New Hope wasn't my favorite Star War, uh, but it became that when I saw the the making of Star Wars the documentary, and I saw just what what a trial it was oh, for George, for Gary, and for all those people you know going through that the desert and all that. So Star Wars became my favorite movie because it was just such a challenge for them to uh, to make. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, number two would be Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I see a theme growing. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> and then the third one would be uh, Back to the Future Part Three. Yep. It was all 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 Spielberg, all Spielberg touch. Yeah. One yeah. Last it's it was part three you liked the best. Yeah, and I got flack for that in film school. <laughs> really? Part three? Interesting, because I actually, part three is probably my second. My first, uh -huh. I love number one, I love number three, and then I love number two, the last. Yeah. And number two is just congenitive tissue that you need to get to three. Uh, <laughs> and it has its own fun parts about it. But three is yeah. actually really fun. I love, I, I love three. So I, I think three, I, so I love Westerns. Them, and, that's, yeah, yeah. I think, but as a kid, you know, growing up and I, I was the oldest child. And so they tried to shelter me the most, of, you know, I got three little brothers, they're maniacs, shout out to them, big help mm -hmm. on the movie, but mm -hmm. they're three little brothers, they're maniacs, but I was the shelter one. I was the one where they were like, you know, we, we need to make sure he's not getting no violence, no drugs, no, you know, and to be fair, I, I haven't given into the drugs. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm drug free right now, but, but the, you know, but the night, but the night is young, sir. The night is young. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have mom tune out right now. Thank you. <laughs> but the, uh, so, so I, I think that I've just got this part of me that just loves the old West. And when it comes to showing, you know, an eight year old, a Western, you can't do that. Uh, uh. But Dad will always want to show an eight-year-old Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. And so I think Back to the Future Part 3 was my first Western, and that's why it's my favorite, is because, you know, this pastiche of, of years of spaghetti Westerns was actually my first one. And by the time I saw a Clint Eastwood film, you know, in my teens, I was like, oh, the iron on his chest. I got it. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I see what this is. He's making a reference. Exactly. You, you, you uh, I guess, reverse engineered the Western for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's the name of the game. And now where can people find uh, you and your work? Sure. Uh, sure. I'm uh, uh, my handle for all my social media is mad smatter. Um, that was a nickname that somebody came up for me in high school. Uh, so, um, but if, if you just Google Rob smat, there's only one of me. I'm not smart. Um, that's, that's the tag. There it is. Now, now you'll never forget that. Right. Um, there's only one of me. And then, uh, the last whistle is available on all, all digital platforms. Uh, you know, whatever's easiest for you, go check it out. Please give us a click. Well, even if it's just a little rent, um, it a little rental means the world to us. And, um, and, uh, and just, yeah, check me out. I'm, I'm everywhere and, and hopefully I'll keep going after this. You are a unique snowflake, sir, as all of us are. <laughs> as, a right. millennial, as a millennial. A as a that, disenfranchised man. millennial, you are. I say, I know. <laughs>
<laughs> Rob, man, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on your show, man. Thank you for dropping some serious knowledge bombs on the trap today, man. Thanks so much. You got it. <laughs> <laughs>